the King, comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who art ever present and fillest all things, treasure her blessings and give her of life. Come and abide us and cleanse us from every impurity. Save our souls, O good one. Amen. So we're starting a new series tonight on confession. Um, but before we do that, does anybody have any uh, any old business? <laughs> any, any questions on anything else? I think we talked about hallucinus last last time. So okay. Well, confession is a really important uh, aspect of our life as Orthodox Christians. And one of the things that, um, not, that probably none of us do is go to confession often enough. Of course, saying that, I make more work for myself. <laughs> but um, but it's, a really, it's a really important thing. Um, uh, just a, a very brief historical kind of uh, overview. Um, conf- in the early church, confession was not done on one hand, confession was not done uh, frequently, at least in the, in the full form, um, because it was primarily reserved for the sins of apostasy, um, that if you had offered uh, uh, incense to the emperor um, in the time of persecution, uh, you had one chance. Um, and that was a... That was a really, you know, difficult thing. Um, on the other hand, one of the things that is not taken into account by some of the scholars is that in, uh, in the scriptures, it talks about confess your sins to one another um, and to uh, take account, you know, um, I, should, I didn't get, the, I was thinking to get the quotes and I forgot. And, and I didn't. But, uh, but, the, but the practice of, of examining your conscience and clearing your conscience before you receive Holy Communion goes back not only to uh, uh, St. Paul in, the, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, you also find it um, in a little more specific language in the Didache, which uh, undoubtedly reflects the uh, the, lang- the the tradition of, of the apostles, um, <clears throat> it didn't make the, the final cut uh, for the scriptures, but uh, that doesn't matter. It's still a very important document. Um, his- historically, um, Christians, thus you know, based on that scriptural evidence, you know, from the very beginning have done some kind of examination of conscience uh, as a means of preparing for the whole, for Holy Communion. Um, and of course, in the scriptures, it's, it presumes that we are preparing for Holy Communion. Um, it, it's not like we can, you know, we just uh, waltz up to the chalice and, um, you know, and without any forethought and, and then go back without any forethought or afterthought. Um, but uh, there, there's a whole canon of preparation for Communion. Um, there's a whole set of prayers of preparation, there's prayers of, um, of thanksgiving, um, and in some traditions there are very extensive uh, 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 rules uh, which always uh, include confession um, as means of uh, preparation for communion. Um, and so for example, um, well I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. In the early church, everybody uh, received the Eucharist all the time, unless they were under a penance. And this is this is where uh, confession comes in. If you sinned in a in a in a grave way, um, you were given a penance. And this uh, this is a, a discipline that be- began to develop um, after the uh, uh, after the church was legalized. And then um, in 320, in, in 312, Christianity was legalized. In, but it wasn't until 381 that the church was made the, religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
which meant that if you wanted the job with the state, you had to, you had to be a Christian. Um, and so there was this vast influx of people into the church um, who wanted to uh, work for the state. And you know, that meant to be, you know, to be a soldier, to be some, you know, some kind of bureaucrat. And you know, the Roman state was, was a huge bureaucratic organization. We, it was a huge empire. Uh, we ought to know what that's about. Um, and it had lots of different kinds of departments and all, all this other stuff. So there was this, this great influx into, of people into the church. That's when parishes began to develop. Previously, up, in, up through the first council, um, the pastor of every parish was a bishop. The pastor of every church was a bishop. Um, the presbyters, uh, the word priest is just a contraction of the word presbyter. It, it was presbyter, or presbyteros, presbyter, prester in Old, in old English, and priest. Um, they were the parish council. It was the board of elders. Um, and basically, you can still see that in a hierarchical, liter a hierarchical liturgy, um, the priests don't do anything. They basically just stand there and look pretty. <laughs> you know, with the, with the big vestments, you know, and all the brocade and all that stuff. You know, but they're just, they're not doing anything. Um, you know, they may get a line. If there's enough of them, they may not get a line. Um, but uh, the hierarchical liturgy is basically the bishop and the deacon, or deacons, going back and forth. Um, and if the bishop is in a good mood, he'll share the lines with the, <laughs> with the priests. Um, well, under, underneath all of that is this, this, the whole spiritual life of the church. And of course, the big liturgical celebrations were in the cathedrals. And the bigger the city, the bigger the cathedral. And the more, uh, the more important the city, the more important not only the cathedral, but the, the Episcopal see uh, in order of ranking. And so that's where we get this whole thing of the diptychs and all of this. Um, but, because, uh, be, but because initially the practice was that all the Christians in the city would go to the one Eucharist celebrated by the bishop, that no longer became possible, even though some of the churches were huge. And so uh, the bishop would assign presbyters to churches, to parishes, and this is where the whole presbyteral form of the liturgy developed, and as well as, as the organization of, of local parishes. Um, now, within that, uh, at the same time, you had the development of monasticism. And part of, and part of the idea and the impetus of monasticism was to return to a, um, a more primitive sense of the, um, uh, of the life of, of the church, uh, one that, where there wasn't um, the kind of compromise that was necessary when you had you know, hundreds and hundreds of people you know, who knew nothing about Christianity and were there because they wanted to have a job with the state. Um, and so you had the, the advent of nominal, kind of nominalism uh, in the church. Um, that had other consequences. That's when the prayers began to be read silently. Um, the priest's prayers began to be read silently. Even though the emperor published a law that they were that they had to be read aloud. Um, at the same time, in the monasteries, which started out as a lay movement, um, it was a, it was essentially a discipleship movement. It was people following a spiritual father who would live in a community organized by the spiritual father or a spiritual mother, and 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 the women monastics would be dependent on the male monastics. Um, for services, but otherwise the women's communities were were pretty much uh, autonomous, except for the sacraments, and they had to have a priest uh, to do that. Uh, thank you very much. Please pass these around. <laughs>
There's two pages to the handout, and they're just even leaved. And I'll tell you all about this in the process. In monasticism, uh, started out there were no priests. Um, the, the monasteries would go to the local parish to go to liturgy. Um, this, uh, this was a, uh, uh, this was a fine arrangement for a while, except uh, it wasn't too long before the uh, there were too many monks uh, that were kind of flooding the local parishes. Do we need more copies? Okay. Yes. Yeah, maybe couples could share. Um, okay, so we need. How many, how many more copies do we need? I think we're good. Everybody? Um, so in the beginning in the monasteries there were no priests, but uh, it became necessary that the priests be designated because not only uh, were there these, uh, uh, it, w it was impossible for the, for the whole monastery to go to a local parish, but the monasteries developed their own liturgical life. Um, and they were developing a spiritual life. And in the monasteries, um, you had the whole practice of confession of thoughts um, now and spiritual direction. And because one of the main tasks of an abbot um, or a spiritual father in a monastery is spiritual direction, and that comes through the practice of confession of thoughts. Confession of thoughts is... Um, uh, it's only possible in a monastic setting. It's not possible in a, in a parochial or worldly setting um, because you need to have the spiritual father right there available most of the time. Um, and what it is, it's, uh, the, the point is that you keep track of your thoughts, especially the intrusive thoughts, the ones, the logis me, the thoughts that, are, that bug you, um, is, you know, sinful thoughts of, of various kinds, and especially the ones that you fixate on. And, uh, and you go and you, uh, you confess them to the spiritual father, and that already gives you control over those thoughts. The thoughts really aren't, um, sin, aren't necessarily sinful, uh, or they can be sinful, depends on, on what you do with them. But the... Uh, um, But just the act of confession, of exposing the thought, and of uh, uh, and asking forgiveness for it, that already is a you know it already gives you more control. Now, along with you know monks in monasteries and nuns in in convents sin just like anybody else. And so there are some things that require a little more serious attention. And if the, if the father confessor is not a priest, he can't give absolution. So that was another reason why they put priests in monasteries. Um, and so to a great degree, uh, many of the, uh, the practices of uh, confession and of spiritual fatherhood of confession of thoughts and spiritual direction evolved in the monasteries. Monasticism, by the way, was huge. You're talking about 10% of the population um, in the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, were monastic. That's immense. There were, at, around the year 1000, there were a million people living so, inside the walls of Constantinople, and 100,000 of them were monks and nuns.
Um, and they had to come, you know, they even had to come up with, with laws about, well, what happens if, you know, a, a widow converts her property into a, into a, a, a convent and, and, and all of a sudden it's off the tax rolls. Well, you can imagine that there would be some consequences when you don't have the income, right? Because their structure was not that much different than ours. So right now we're up to, say, the year 1000. Um, at the same time, in the, in the parochial and urban settings of the church, because Christianity was primarily an urban movement in the, in the East, in the West you had something else totally going on, but in the Eastern Church, which was, you know, you had this, you know, basically, um, in much of the, of the empire there was, there was peace for a long time, you know, there were contra spirit, or, or theological controversies and things like that. But for the most part, you know, they bought off the barbarians, so they went around the Byzantine Empire and, and afflicted the West. Um, you know, they, they exiled the heretics to the uh, forests in the north where they converted the German tribes into Aryans and, who, and they afflicted the West, but they went around. Um, they exiled the Nestorians and the Monophysites um, when they could to Arabia, well, that produced Islam, so that didn't work very well. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they were kind of at bay up until around 700, 650 or thereabouts. Um, and you had this huge problem of all of these people who were kind of nominally Orthodox, nominally Christian, um, and who they, uh, the Roman Empire had a, um, a rather famous um, debauched kind of life um, that didn't necessarily die when um, Constantine legalized Christianity or when Theodosius uh, proclaimed that Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, you, had, you had the old going on and the new kind of trying to replace it, but you know, they, were, they were at battle. You know, just read the fathers. Um, and so uh, there, were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of issues, uh, especially people who were converting um, who, did, who then began to take it seriously. Um, and, uh, and by this time, there were also many people who had been uh, baptized in infancy and then had gone off and lived a debauched life and then, then were returning to the church. Uh, how did they return? Well, this is where um, the practice of, of uh, sacramental confession, as, along with a penitential discipline, evolved. Um, and uh, in the, at the, the last, I don't know, 300 years, or the middle 300 years of the last half of the first millennium, there was this radical um, penitential discipline um, and you can read all about it in the canons, um, where, they, uh, where people were um, given these huge penances um, as a means of working their way back into the life of the church. <clears throat> now, uh, this would include, for example, 10 years of excommunication for murder, 10 years of excommunication for abortion, uh, 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 some uh, you know, some sins uh, carried excommunication for, until your deathbed. Um, this was, you know, these were very serious. Uh, this was a very serious discipline, and it even affected the architecture of the church, because um, part of the discipline was that um, if you had sinned publicly, well. They got rid of public confession of sins fairly soon. Um, that was probably the first few, two or three hundred years, uh, three hundred years of the life of the church. Confession became private, but still every sin had a, still had a public kind of side. So if you had committed, I don't know, some kind of certain sin, you might be assigned to 
stand on the steps of the porch of the church and make a, a prostration or a bow uh, to everybody going in the church and you were forbidden to go any closer into the church than that. Then after a couple of years of that, in which you had to show up every Sunday and do that, <laughs> uh, maybe they would let you in inside the porch of the church and then maybe another couple of years of that. And then they might let you into the narthex. Um, and, uh, and you could stand with the catechumens, um, but you had to leave with the catechumens. Um, and that was when they, they threw the catechumens out of, out of liturgy and then shut the door. Um, you know, you know we, still, we still have in our liturgy the expression, the doors, the doors in wisdom let us attend, right? Um, and in uh, a lot of Russian practice, um, that means that the royal doors of the iconostas are opened so that everybody can you know, see the altar and the priest for the creed. Not in Greek practice. Greek practice is, is, is different than that. But um, what it was originally, that meant that the doors of the church, the doors to the nave, were shut and barred. And they had um, liturgical bouncers um, uh, uh, who were actually a, an ordained order of um, doorkeepers um, who would uh, admit people or not admit people. But most likely they would not admit you if you showed up late. Um, especially after the doors were shut. And it's like, too bad. <laughs> um, you know, listen to the rooster. Because <laughs> they didn't exactly have alarm clocks back then. Um, or the bells. So, anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the ideal um, has always been that the entire community of the church partakes of the Eucharist. But then you have all of these penitents who have been cut off from the Eucharist for years and years. And pretty soon, with the rules like that, you had far more penitents than you had communicants. <laughs> So that didn't work. <laughs> um, and finally they got over that. Um, and the whole penitential system collapsed. Except it's still in our canons. So if you want to read the canons of St. John the Faster, um, which is X-rated, by the way, I, he um, writes about every possible sin, every possible sexual sin from every possible angle, and it's like, um, it's too much. It's just too much. Um, uh, but uh, that's in the corpus of the canons. Um, and it's, uh, well, it's a little problematic. Um, on the other hand, there are some very important spiritual insights uh, in, in much of that literature that came out of that. Um, because what, what was happening is there was a fusion of this uh, discipline of confession of major sins, which in the first, say, 500 years uh, would have been public, or 400 years would have been public confession, after that, it was private confession, but uh, it had to be major stuff. You can imagine that even Hagia Sophia, which, which had, by the seventh century, it took 200 clergy to pull off the liturgy. Now, the choir were also ordained, the choir and you know, the subdeacons and the doorkeepers and, you know, and all of these, you know, but between the bishop, the, the priests, the deacons, you know, subdeacons, readers, and all of that took 200 people. Um, so it was this grand, grand liturgy. Um, but if everybody wanted, if if everybody of the 10,000 people that would show up to liturgy on a Sunday um, wanted to go go to confession, there wouldn't be enough clergy. It wouldn't work. So it was only the major stuff that got dealt with. 
Um, so it, it was a, it's a it's a kind of a um, uh, an interesting conundrum that the church was facing. Um, of course, the uh, dealing with people on a on a pastoral basis, I think probably developed much more in the parishes um, where you didn't have the entire city or a, a, a substantial proportion of the city show up to liturgy, but where you had the village, you know, maybe the 40, 50, 60 people who lived in the village could come. The priests could hear their confessions over the course of the week, and, um, and there was a regular cycle. Now, the, another aspect of this is that, remember, 10% of the population lived in monasteries. Keep the lay people from the church, from the villages, and from the cities would go and visit the monasteries, and um, and you know go there. Maybe they had a spiritual father there. They would go to confession there. You know they'd be inspired by the life of the monks. They, you know, they'd take offerings and, and help out and all of this stuff. And and that still goes on today in Orthodox countries, very much. And the monasteries rely on the lay people, and the lay people rely on the monasteries. And, and, and it's a huge support to the faithful. Uh, the big urban cathedrals are um, much, much more uh, impersonal, although there's always a, a little group. Um, but even in the, from the big urban cathedrals, many of the people for spiritual direction would go to the monasteries, and the cities were full of monasteries. So. Um, so you had this fusion going on between monastic spiritual fatherhood and the practice of spiritual direction, um, and on the side, uh, the spiritual father's ministry to the monks uh, was primarily through confession of thoughts, but the ministry of the spiritual father to the lay people would, pro would, would, be, hearing, would be to hear their confessions on a much more intense way than you could at the local urban cathedral um, where, uh, you know, just like up in D.C. at St. John's. Um, okay, you know, there's, there's a line of 50 people. The vigil only lasts so long. Um, you got three minutes or five minutes, you know, and that's it. Um, so historically, uh, by the year 1000, our current practice had very much evolved. Um, of course, here in America, uh, the number of monasteries is very small. Um, and so while people still go to monasteries and have spiritual fathers or spiritual mothers in the monasteries, um, you don't have the, as intense a, an exposure to the monasteries as you did when they were literally a few blocks away um, or a couple miles away. People would go, you know, would walk for miles. They didn't, that was kind of normal at that time. <clears throat> and so what is our practice now? And especially in the Russian church, um, the practice has remained very, very traditional. You, and you find virtually the same practice. The details are different, but, uh, but the practice is basically the same in the Greek and the Romanian and the Serbian and the, in, the in, the, in, the, in the very traditional churches. There's no substantial difference. There's little liturgical differences between those churches, but nothing, you know, the, you know, the chant is different, the language is different. You know, you're not likely to get um, a, a cabbage and garlic, um, you know, in a, in a Greek church, you're more likely to get squid and olive oil, you know. Um, <laughs> But otherwise, I mean, there, it's, orthodoxy is substantially similar throughout the world. Um, and the practice of confession is intimately related to preparation for communion. Now, also at this time um, in the Byzantine Empire, because of the number of people, um, I think, and the uh, uh, who knows what kind of pietistic movements and things um, 
Uh, I'm not a good scholar of that part of uh, Byzantine history. Um, people stopped going to communion on a frequent basis. Uh, probably especially the more nominal. They would go once a year or twice a year. They'd go four times a year. They'd go during, they'd go during the four fasts because fasting was, um, was required uh, to go to communion. Um, and so, uh, for example, the rule, of, the rule arose that you had to fast for a week. That's, that's a strict fast for a whole week before going to communion. Um, no, uh, no meat, no dairy, no fish, no olive oil, no, I mean, basically dry eating. And, um, you know, and then an absolute fast um, from midnight, and then you could, then, then you'd go to communion on uh, one of the feast days at the end of those fasts, because why fast extra, right? You know, you know, it was Orthodox, we kind of fast a lot, and so why fast extra? Um, so people quit doing it. They quit going, they quit going to communion. Um, maybe they go at the end of Great Lent, they go during the St. Peter and Paul fast, they go during the Dormition fast, and they go during the Christmas fast. Um, on Mount Athos, um, the practice evolved that um, because Saturday is not a fast day, uh, all the monks would go to communion on Saturday, but not go on Sunday. And that's weird. <laughs> you know, that's weird. Um, and it's, you know, and there's all sorts of strange ideas that have crept in. Now, one of the things about orthodoxy that's important to remember is the old religion has survived, or the old religions have survived. Um, uh, they have in the West too, but not. But the West has gone through so much religious turmoil that it, and then and radical secularization that um, we've got a new paganism. We're not reviving so much the old paganism. There's a little bit of that, but nobody quite remembers. You know what? You know why we knock on wood and and do all of these things. You know, you know. Whereas you know some of the Slavs, you know, they're building fires and jumping over them, and you know, and all sorts of things. Um, and this was a uh, and this was a, a, a difficult thing to get people to kind of leave behind, because these are these are their sacred ethnic traditions, right? Well, um, uh, has any, anybody read Mountain of Silence, Marquides? It's really worthwhile. Um, he's, a, he's a professor, he's from Cyprus originally, but he's a professor of religion in Maine. And he wrote the, these, uh, these brilliant books um, uh, about Orthodox spirituality uh, because he went through a reconversion. He'd gone, He'd left the church. He'd become a kind of new age Gnostic, and then, um, and then his doctoral dissertation was on witchcraft in in Cyprus, or in Greece, in Greek culture, and witchcraft persists um, in Greek culture. And what is witchcraft? It's the old religion, you know, it's old Hellenistic religion, you know, plus a few other kinds of. It's, it's always syncretic. Um, in other words, it blends in other elements. You know, so for example, in the Greek church, one of the things that a priest often has to do is read the prayers to free people from the evil eye. Um, the Greeks are into that. Nobody else seems to be that I know of. Um, but that's all part of the old religion. Um, the Slavs have their own religion. One of the most interesting things is to... Um, and I don't, re don't recommend it, um, is to consult a native healer from, like, Ukraine. They're very interesting. <laughs> and it's this, this cross between old religion and Christianity and this weird stuff. This weird stuff. <laughs> 
Um, one person I know had one of these pe one of these people come and do a healing. Had to, they had to uh, um, uh, light a, light a candle in front of an icon every day at a certain time, and they had to walk around the icon three times, and then they had to uh, to offer some kind of tonic or something that they would would drink. But first they had to offer it to the icon. You know, all sorts of weird stuff. Um, and it's just old paganism. Um, now, we don't, in American culture, I, we, we've, got, we've got some remnants of that. Um, but for the most part, uh, we're certainly not clean slates, but uh, we have, uh, um, we, we do have certain attitudes that are left. Anyway, I'm, I'm, off, I'm off topic. Um, <clears throat> so preparation for communion, but the whole, but actually witchcraft and sorcery and all of that kind of stuff will reappear later on um, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the talk tonight. Um, so, so this, <clears throat> in the Russian church, you know, what, what evolved is um, was this this practice of communion, especially people going to monasteries um, for spiritual fathers there, and part of the reason for that was the village priests were chosen from uh, just from the pious men in the in the parish. Uh, it happened in Greece too, all throughout the Orthodox world. Some of them could read. <laughs> Some of them couldn't. Um, the ones that couldn't probably had the entire gospel memorized. Um, but uh, it, was, it was just, you know, basically the pious men in the parish um, who uh, accepted the, the task of, um, of uh, serving the church or doing the services, but they were never allowed to hear confessions. Um, and they weren't allowed to preach either. They were. Uh, they basically served the liturgy. Uh, those that had could read well would read um, a sermon from from the fathers or a sermon from the you know sent around from the bishop or something like that. Um, and here again, throughout the Orthodox world. So here you had the practice that people would not go be going to communion. Partly also because they couldn't couldn't go to confession, because the local priest couldn't hear their confessions. He didn't he didn't have a blessing to hear their confessions. Um, you know you know the vestment that um, uh, that I wear. It's like a, a kind of a diamond shaped thing hanging down, called an epigonatium. Um, in the uh, in the Russian church, it's, it's an award. But in the Greek church, it's a kind of an award, but it's only given to priests who are deemed uh, uh, worthy by the bishop of being spiritual fathers. So in the Greek church, for example, not every priest has a blessing to hear confessions. Um, now, especially in the Greek church in America, you know, where the clergy are, for the most part, very well educated, you have different reasons for that. But... Um, how, who, quite frankly, who wants to go to confession to a 25-year-old? <laughs> I mean, in the fullness of their wisdom. <laughs> you know? um, probably not. Um, in the Greek church, uh, especially during the Ottoman period, uh, when Christianity was heavily suppressed, uh, there would be one father confessor in a diocese who would go from parish to parish. Uh, in the Russian church, which, um, despite the, the Mongol yoke um, until, until almost the year uh, 1400, um, people were free to go to monasteries and, and freely did go to monasteries. And so they would go to confession and communion at the monastery and then go back and they'd go to liturgy, but they wouldn't go to communion, um, except on their names day or if they'd gone to confession to their spiritual father, and he had given them a blessing to keep communing. 
uh, this, this pattern pretty much held through the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, um, uh, starting in 1917, you had this hideous persecution of the church. Um, and the massacre of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Christians by socialists. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to be talking about this, by the way, especially to um, that generation of people who think socialism is cool and in their delusion. And it's a total delusion. Um, it's a very evil thing. Um, but, so, in, during, the, during the Soviet period, uh, al almost all the churches in Russia were closed. Um, on the other hand, there were, uh, uh, and not all the priests and bishops were, uh, were murdered. Uh, some were sent to the gulags and then returned. Um, some, um, and some were, were still free. And so there were communities of believers who would meet in living rooms of houses and in basements and things like that and serve the liturgy. Um, but it was at, at this time during the persecution that uh, in the Russian Orthodox world, uh, the practice of frequent communion resumed um, because you never knew if there was going to be a knock at the door. Um, and so people would go to confession on a more or less regular basis to somebody, some priest that they could get a hold of. Um, the Russian exiles um, maintained the old practice, going to communion once or twice a year on, uh, on your name's day, maybe on Holy Saturday, maybe Holy Thursday. You know, so you wouldn't have to fast too much extra. Um, and that was it. That was it. Um, and they, you know, would have this elaborate preparation over days and days and days. Well, if you're only going to communion once or twice a year, are, what's the motivation to keep Wednesday and Friday fasts? What's the motivation to keep the other fasts? What's the motivation... And so, and so basically the life of the church uh, went down. The level of the church's life went down. You still had the pious people who um, went to the monasteries and, and frequented the monasteries and got spiritual direction there. But to a great, to a great degree, um, the life in the parishes uh, was pretty formal, pretty external. Um, social, just social. Um, you know, they were very pious when they would go into church and, you know, and all of this stuff and, you know, light the candles and make the cross and, you know, so in the, so in the post-Soviet period, what all, you know, what that whole mix ended up being with, and especially with a massive reconversion, um, and it's, it, it's interesting to talk to uh, people who remained faithful during the whole Soviet period. Um, you know, they would have a, a cabinet in their, in their house, and you'd open it up and it would be a whole iconostas. But otherwise it was kept shut, so that nobody would see. Um, uh, they had, but they remained faithful, they did their prayers, they, did the, they kept the fast, they kept the discipline of the church, and um, they, they probably went to communion on a much more frequent basis. However, since the fall of the Soviet power, a hundred million people came, were baptized in Russia. In, do the math. There's, 30, there's about 30 or 35,000 church buildings now in Russia. How many people can you fit into 30 or 35,000 buildings? And some of them are the size of our church. Some of them are huge, but a lot of them are small. Three, four million people. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, the church just isn't big enough. It, 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 it hasn't been, it's, uh, they haven't had the chance to restore enough buildings or to build enough buildings to accommodate the new people. So if the people aren't going to church, you know, where's their piety? Where's, where's all of that going? And it's, and so they have a mess. They have a mess in Russia. Um, on the other hand, in the, the renewed parishes and in the renewed monasteries, um, where you have um, the spiritual direction, where you have um, the inspiration of people leading very strong ascetic lives, um, in those monastic communities, um, the piety of the church is flourishing. So you go to Moscow, and it's an incredibly powerful Orthodox city. And you ride on the, you ride on the subway, and you see people reading their morning prayers, you know, um, or going to church, and they're reading the pre-communion prayers, you know, and, and all the women are in, you know, headscarves and, just, um, you know, ready for church and things like that. Um, and actually in Thessaloniki you see something similar Athens is a different story Athens is very secular but Thessaloniki is a profoundly orthodox city um, and I would imagine Bucharest is as well and, and you know others um, but along with that comes the desire on one hand for frequent communion and a piety which demands confession. And so what does that mean? There have to be lots of priests to hear the confessions. Because, but there's always a few that are, you know, that people flock to. So has everybody heard of, anybody heard of uh, Father Artemi Vladimirov? Um, he's a big, big, well-known priest in Moscow, has been to America many times, speaks fluent English. Um, uh, I went to his parish soon after I got to Moscow in 1993. And um, I, was, I was astonished because I had been the choir director in, in a little church in Saratoga, California, near San Jose. And this parish in Moscow used exactly the same repertoire only in Slavonic, that we had done the week before in English. <laughs> All the music was identical. Um, I, was, I was surprised. But what really surprised me was that it took four hours to wait to get confession. And how many Americans wait four hours to go to confession? And Father Artemi, at that time a very um, energetic young priest, now he's, a, he's my age, so he's, he's a very energetic, less than young priest. <laughs> um, he, would, he would hear confessions until 2 o'clock in the morning. Every night. Every night, if you can imagine. So... Um, I went to another uh, elder. Um, there's, there's an elder at uh, Trinity de Saint Sergius Lock. There were two elders. One was Father Kirill, who ultimately I kind of clung to. <laughs> um, the other was Elder Naum. And Elder Naum was very charismatic and very flamboyant and, you know, kind of prophetic. And, you know, and um, the men liked Elder Kirill. Um, and he had a hundred men's monasteries under him, probably 10,000 monks. Um, Elder Naum appealed to the women, um, and he had scores of women's monasteries under him. Um, but so it was a nun who dragged me to see Elder Naum, and um, I went to see, and I w we went to see him, and we had to stand in line for four hours. Or it may have been longer than that. Um, because there was, there was, there were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of babushki, for the most part, lined up to go in and see the elder and, you know, and 
and go to confession. Um, and so uh, <coughs> that's a problem that we don't have in the United States. But for the most part, what has evolved, especially in Rokor, um, since that is most relevant to us, is that um, uh, people are encouraged to go to communion on a weekly basis. Um, and to a great degree, confession, of course, is required before communion, but not necessarily before every communion. Um, so if you go to confession once every couple of weeks, you're fine. Uh, unless you commit some grand sin, which uh, prevents you from going to communion. Um, so it's really, uh, uh, and, our, and our preparation for communion um, is basically uh, the, uh, follows the canon, of the, church, the canon of the church preparation. In other words, we keep the fasts on Wednesday and Friday and the designated fast days. You don't fast extra, don't have to fast extra before going to communion. If you wish to, that's nice. If you don't want to, that's, that's all right. If, as long as you keep the designated fast of the church, you're, uh, you're in good shape. Um, and you read the canon of, of preparation, which, which is, uh, normally consists of the three canons, canon to Christ, canon to the mother of God, and a canon to the guardian angel. Um, and it's all in a handy dandy little uh, book that's put together that you can get. Um, plus the prayers of uh, preparation for communion, which includes the canon of preparation for communion, uh, uh, the three psalms, uh, some triparia, and the ten prayers. Um, that's that's uh, what Rokor is holding up as the norm, um, plus, com plus confession on a, on a regular basis. So it's a, and so confession is a, has be in the parishes has become this combination of uh, spiritual direction as well as confession of, of major sins. Um, the penitential discipline has uh, largely uh, been radically simplified, to say the least. Um, and uh, few and, and it's very un, it's very unusual to get very long penances in a in a parochial setting. Um, now, the one thing that complicates matters. Um, uh, and, and by the way, Rokor is the strictest of the jurisdictions um, on the whole. Um, you know, there, there are places that require more, some, re some require less, but that's the norm that uh, Rokor expects. Um, uh, we can talk more about the discipline of preparation for communion. <clears throat> there are also... Um, uh, one, of, one, of, one of the uh, biggest uh, shocks to the American pious system of, or system of piety was the advent of the, of the monasteries of Elder Ephraim, um, who, who, brought, uh, who brought Athenite piety uh, to America. Um, uh, 19, back in 1995, before he had found um, uh, land, for, uh, even for St. Anthony's in Arizona, <clears throat> uh, the abbot of Valam, who's my, my spiritual father, came over and he wanted to meet Elder Ephraim. Um, and so uh, we arranged a meeting, for six, and it, we had six hours with the elder in which he laid out his whole vision for America. And he said, and he had spiritual children, so he got to know he'd got here, so he'd gotten to know the Orthodox landscape, as it were. And um, and he said, well, here we are. The Russians have monasteries. The Serbs have monasteries. 
but uh, the Greeks have no monasteries. The Bulgarians had a mon you know, every, everybody had monasteries but the Greeks, which, and this was up until 1996, okay? Um, and so he believed that he was being called to not only establish uh, monasteries here, but he said, well, the Greek archdiocese, everything, it's all upside down, you know. The church is supposed to be based on the monasteries and the parishes grow out of the monasteries. But instead you have the parishes primary and monasteries are relegated to, well, they weren't relegated to anything at the time. So he said he wanted to set things right. He wanted to make sure that everything was um, on a stable basis in, in traditional Orthodox piety. Well... Uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of Athenite monasticism is that it uh, is very strict um, in its uh, adherence to the canons. It uh, doesn't matter that the rest of the church has basically disregarded uh, certain canons for a thousand years. Um, it also doesn't seem to matter that... Um, some of, these, some of the confessors had no long-going relationship with the people who came to confession. Um, so they took it upon themselves um, to help people to understand what their sins were um, by interrogating them intimately. Intimately. Um, and this caused a huge problem. Now, in the Greek archdiocese, you know, in the Russian church, every, every priest basically has a blessing to hear confessions from the day of his ordination. In the Greek archdiocese, not every priest has a blessing to hear confessions. So people were going to confession, or going to communion on a regular basis without confession. Um, in my first uh, mission parish, I had a, a Greek lady from, uh, uh, from New Hampshire, and she had the accent. Her husband had been a, an Air Force officer. They had been stationed at the Air Force Base right next to Merced in Atwater. I don't know if you know. Um, and uh, so he had died, and she was a widow there. And, and she was 75, and she said, well, I've been going to, I've, I've been ortho, ortho, Orthodox for 75 years. I've gone to church every Sunday, um, and I've never been to confession, and I'm not going to start now. <laughs> She's a feisty lady. <laughs> and, you know, here's, you know, here I was a kid, you know, right? So I, I couldn't blame her on one hand. But um, eventually she did. Eventually she did. Um, so it was a, uh, it, but this, you know, this kind of attitude that developed uh, significantly in the Greek archdiocese also overflowed to the Antiochian archdiocese. And in the OCA, you had, God knows, you had a whole panoply of practices from as strict or stricter than Rokor to as open as the Greek archdiocese. And you never knew depended on the parish what they were going to do. Um, the OCA is, shall we say, very diverse um, in its practice. Um, so uh, when, when people started going to the, to the monastery, the, these Greek monasteries, and um, being interrogated by some of these Hiram monks, um, especially as to the details of their sex lives, um, it became, it was quite a shock. And even more of a shock was when they uh, would walk away being cut off from the sacraments for 10 years. Um, and part of that was because these young priests um, who were all zealous and had, you know, they'd read a book. Um, and uh, that was about it. They'd read a book. Um, and were applying that book. And without, and they didn't have a pa any pastoral sense in their heads, um, and so as a result, many people were turned away from the church. 
and it created a pastoral disaster throughout the Orthodox Church. Um, there are other issues that also created a pastoral disaster with those monasteries, but we won't. Um, but from the monasteries' perspective, they were just doing what they thought it was important to do to help people to understand how they needed to, to repent and change their lives. Um, from, the, from, the, from the parish priest's point of view, and this was across the jurisdictional map, and in fact, it's not just priests in the Greek archdiocese, but even priests in Rokor won't give the blessings to their parishioners to either go and visit some of these monasteries or much less to go to confession. Um, and uh, because, because of the advice that we're getting. So um, that, that caused a little minor tidal wave in American orthodoxy. Um, and, and the problems are still there today. So that's kind of a historical overview. Um, anybody have que any questions? Is it clear? Yes, no? Clear how the practices kind of evolved over the course of the centuries? I always, I always feel like it's really important to have a historical context. You know, we're a totally historically rooted church. Um, is it clear what, what the general um, rule is for preparation for communion? Yeah. What was to be read again? You had mentioned it. Okay. <clears throat> it's three canons. Um, it's, all, it's all in the uh, Jordan Bill Kerr book. And it's all in the... Uh, and then there's also a little book um, that Jordan Hill put together where the three canons are put together. Um, and you have this whole little book of preparation for communion. Um, I recommend that, by the way. It's very handy. OCA had one, too. What's that? OCA had one, too. The OCA does as well, uh, St. Tithon's prayer book. Um, then, even better, there's a recording from Holy Cross Monastery where you can, where you can you know, put it in your CD player or program it into your phone and listen and to it. it's on YouTube. And it's on all, YouTube? They're all on YouTube also. Yeah. Back in the 90s, when I was in 93, when I was living in Moscow, um, I was with the uh, uh, Father Melchizedek from Optina. Um, and Father Melchizedek was about six foot six, this big, hulking uh, priest monk. And when he smiled, all of his teeth were gold. <laughs> that was the style that, you know. Um, of course, I don't think they did white replacements or at that time. Anyway. Um, and he was like the economo of the monastery. In other words, he had to travel all over the place and, you know, looking after the economic needs of the monastery and buy whatever needed to be bought. And, you know, and, and so um, he went to Elder Ili. Elder Ili is now Patriarch Kirill's spiritual father. Um, he's no longer in Optina. He's living in Peradelkino with where the Patriarch lives. And so um, at least, at least a lot of the time, and uh, incredible holy man. Um, and the elder, uh, evidently, he said, well, you know, Father, I've, you know, I'm on the road so much, what if I have a tape, this was back in the era of tapes, tape cassettes, uh, if, what if I have a tape of, of the prayers of the daily, um, you know, the daily prayers of the monastic rule, which is the three canons, what the three canons are from. And he says, well, that's very good. And your tape player will be praying, <laughs> but you will not. And your tape player will be saved. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it's, still, it's still a good thing to, to listen to the prayers. Um, so, what? Uh, 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 no questions. Yes. I have a comment. Sure. Because um, what you were talking about that when you have these extreme penances that like what are happening in some of the monasteries that you mentioned, 
our book club just read Wounded by Love, same book mm -hmm. here is, and it was very interesting. We had a discussion about when he was a young monk and he came off of Mount Athos, he did the same thing. Mm -hmm. He was in Athens and he was a spiritual father. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, so you did that. You know, 40 years, no communion for you. And he, I guess, would hear confessions a lot of times once a year, like also what you were saying. And he noticed that when he would ask the people in the following years, you know, they're going to church, all these people that had been given these really heavy penances actually said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to church. And he said, well, why are you going to church? And they all said, well, I figure I'm going to hell any house since I can't have communion for 40 years. And then he totally like changed his right. penance, and he just would tell them to read about the saints or read the Bible, and and, uh, he, and that was really um, right. very good for his spiritual children. It's not just here that happens, like, Oh yeah, no, it's 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 the same over there, but it was I think more of a shock to the system over here yeah, because it, this whole system got imported wholesale, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden you've got an Athenite monastery in the middle of the Arizona desert or in the hills of Pennsylvania, you know, or something like that. So. Um, The handout. Um, this is a. This was actually a, uh, a pamphlet that I translated um, while sitting under a tree on the lawn, um, and uh, this was a. Uh, it's a. It's a general confession written by St. Ignati Branchaninov. St. Ignati was one of the great spiritual fathers of the 19th century, uh, one of the great monastic writers. And uh, the, um, uh, he, and, and his, his big kind of thing, the most important thing for him, was that the monastics had, had lived first and foremost according to the gospel. You know, to uh, to keep to keep um, the, the the really what monasticism was about was taking the gospel seriously, um, and that he encouraged the monks to know the gospel inside and out. And um, but he was also very familiar with with the patristic literature, and um, his monasteries were extremely well ordered, and so he's uh, come down to us. Uh, his writings have come down to us. He. He died, I think, in 1867, um, as some of the kind of preeminent uh, monastic literature from, from the 19th century, um, uh, when there was a great flowering of monasticism in Russia, thanks to the introduction of uh, the uh, Philokalia, the Dobrotolubia, um, earlier in that century, and the advent of eldership. Um, in Russia, in the monasteries, up through uh, from probably the 15th through the 18th, 16th through the 18th centuries, um, monasticism was very external and very formal. Um, the, pen, the, mona the monks would do all of these uh, feats of, of, of ascetic self-torture. Um, you know, wearing huge chains and, and doing hundreds of prostrations and, you know, and uh, beating themselves, you know. The Catholics had, had a big influence at that time um, in Russia and in Greece as well. Um, and, uh, and they would, you know, and these endless services and it, it just, it was all very, very formal. And so very few and far between were the places that that would do the Jesus prayer. There were no elders, the spiritual fathers. It was all external penances, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, that broke down with the introduction of uh, the Philokalia uh, in, into Russia. And the, and the disciples of St. Pius of who, um, who brought the, the spirituality of the Philokalia from Mount Athos uh, into Russia. And as, and the monasteries began to flourish. Valam and uh, Optina and, and others who, 
develop these great elders, men of profound spiritual life, who were nurtured on the Jesus prayer. Um, and then because of their advanced um, uh, spiritual maturity, they were able to give spiritual direction to other people. Um, and so the um, uh, and so they had they took in disciples and and um, anyway it was it was this great flourishing. Um, father Saint Ignati was was a great spiritual father, and uh, he was a bishop for about four years, um, the bishop of uh, uh, the Caucasus, and then he and then he, he didn't like it, and so he, he quit. Um, and went to, mo to a monastery um, and uh, uh, essentially functioned as the dean of monasteries of the St. Petersburg Diocese. Um, and so he, he brought a tremendous amount of uh, uh, experience to the, uh, to, the, to the position. And his, uh, he has a book called The Arena, has anybody read the arena? Yeah, brilliant book, a wonderful book. It's the Russian title is an offering to contemporary monasticism, and basically it's the fruit of his experience um, over many years, um, which includes the practice of confession. Um, now he was confessor, of course, to the monks in his monasteries, but he also would receive lay people to confession, and one of the uh, things that he wrote is this <clears throat> guided preparation for confession. So, um, now this uh, came to be used in the Russian church, at least um, in the early 90s, this was used in a kind of semi-liturgical way. Um, the uh, the priest would gather all the all the penitents together, um, and would say say the prayers before the prayers before uh, confession, and then it would read this uh, confession, general confession, um, and the uh, and the congregation would say, "Forgive us, O merciful Lord." Uh, or uh, forgive me, Holy Father, or if it was just one. Um, so uh, let's let's read through it. Would somebody like to read it? I'll start. This general confession is used at a uh, uh -huh. monastery and at many places throughout the Russian Orthodox Church as a preparation for the confession. It is especially read following the introductory prayers of the mystery of repentance as a general confession either for a group or for an individual, followed by each person's specific individual confession to the preach. priest. <clears throat> when used corporately, the congregation responds, forgive us, merciful Lord, or individually, forgive me, Holy Father. This was published in 1991 by Aptina Pusin monastery, and was also included in a prayer book published by Balong uh, Monastery in 1993. It is part of a larger set of preparations for confession, which we hope to translate and publish in the near future. Um, I, the great sinner, name, confess to the Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ, and to you, Honorable Father, all of my sins and all of, uh, all of my evil deeds which I have done during every day of my life, and of which I have thought to this very day. I have sinned by breaking the promises of holy baptism in the monastic uh, tonsure, yep. though I consented to each one, and I have not demanded myself to fulfill them. Response, forgive, forgive us, merciful Lord. I have sinned against the Lord by little faith, and by distraction of thoughts from the enemy of us, uh, all against faith and the Holy Church, by unfaithfulness for the Lord's great and ceaseless goodness, and by calling on the Lord's name vainly and without cause. I have sinned by having neither love nor fear of the Lord, 
by not fulfilling his holy will and his, and uh, holy commandments, by un inattentively making the sign of the cross, not piously venerating the holy icons, by not wearing a cross, shame in making the sign of the cross, and thereby confessing the Lord. I have sinned by not per preserving love for my neighbors, not fed the hungry, nor given drink to the thirsty. I have not clothed the naked, nor visited, visited the sick or imprisoned. I have not kept the law of God or the traditions of holy fathers from my laziness and negligence. I have sinned by not fulfilling the church's rule of prayer or my personal rule, by going to church without zeal or ignorance, eagerness, sorry, but with laziness and negligence. I have left off morning, evening, and other prayers during church services. I have sinned by idle, talking, laughing, lack of attention to the singing and reading, distracted thoughts. I have left church during services. I have sinned by not going to church from laziness and my negligence. I have sinned by going to the temple of God in a state of impurity and by touching more of the holy things. I have sinned by disregarding the feasts of God, breaking the fast, and not observing fast days, Wednesday and Friday, <coughs> by gluttony in food and drink, overeating, secret eating, drunkenness, dissatisfaction with food, drink, and clothing, by fulfilling my own will and thoughts, selfish, self, uh, selfishness, self-directedness, and self exaltion by not respecting my parents, by not raising my children in the orthodox faith, by cursing my children and those close to me. I have sinned by disbelief, holding superstitions, doubting, despair, despondency, <coughs> blasphemy, impious lying, dancing, smoking, playing cards, by fortune telling, sorcery, magic, by gossiping, by remembering the living is dead, and by eating the blood of animals. I have sinned by pride, self-opinion, high-mindedness, self-love, love of honor, by envy, self-exaltion, suspicion, and irritability. I have sinned by judging all people, living and dead, by evil words and anger, remembrance of evils, hatred, paying evil for evil, blaming others by wickedness, laziness, deceit, hypocrisy, gossip, bickering, stubbornness, by unwillingness to support or serve my neighbor, by taking delight in evil, by wishing evil on someone, and trapping in evil, by insulting and laughing at others, abuse, man pleasing. I have sinned by vain, vain talking, joking, listening to and remembering word worldly songs, reading inappropriate books, looking at tempting pictures, taking delight in remembrance of past sins, by being overcome by the temptation of the desire for others, by the seduction of others, by, by willfulness, emptiness, preoccupation, with the spirit of the world and worldly habits, which are contrary to the orthodox faith. I have sinned by spiritually and bodily feelings, impurity of soul and body, delighting in and entertaining unclean and passionate thoughts, by passionate and voluptuous arousals and desires for women, youths, and men, by defilements during sleep from impure dreams, and by not preserving my marriage vows. I have sinned by not patiently enduring illness and trials, by love of comfort in this life, by distraction of mind and a hardened heart, and uh, by avoidance of every good work. I have sinned by inattention to spiritual counsel, careless and laziness in reading the Word of God, and in carelessness towards Jesus' prayer. I have sinned by love of gain, love of money, unrighteousness, uh, aggressiveness, embezzlement, thievery, avarice, uh, ooh, my my servicelessness, my servicelessness. Oh, yes. There we go. Preoccupation with various things and people. 
have sinned by judging and disobeying spiritual fathers, arguing with and being offended at them, and by not confessing before them all of my sins because of forgetfulness, carelessness, and false shame. I have sinned by being unmerciful, having contempt for and judging the lowly and meek, going to church without fear of God, praying with a cold heart, with lack of attention, lack of zeal and preparation, and by paying attention to hearsay and sectarian teachings. I have sinned by laziness, weakness for comfort, love of bodily rest, oversleeping by voluptuous dreaming, passionate arousals, shameless movements of the body, by touch, fornication, adultery, the desolate life, masturbation, by extramarital affairs, and by uncrowned civil marriage. I have greatly sinned in having an abortion, or doing one, or persuading someone to that great sin of child murder. I have sinned by spending time in empty and vain occupations, in vain conversations, jokes, laughter, and other shameless sins. I have sinned by falling into despondency, low spirits, impatience, complaining, despair of salvation, by not having hope in the mercy of God, by unfeelingness, ignorance, insolence, and lack of shame. I have sinned by slander of my neighbors, anger, insults, irritation, and ridicule, ir ir uh, irreconcilable, uh, irreconcilably, uh, and enmity and hatred, contradiction and prying into the sins of others and eavesdropping on others' conversation. I have sinned by coldlessness and lack of feeling in confession, by believing my sins, accusation against my neighbors, and by not judging myself. I have sinned against the li uh, life-giving and holy mysteries of uh, Christ. I have come to them without the necessary preparation, without reverence and the fear of God. I, uh, I have sinned in deed, word, thought, and all my senses, touch, hearing, sight, taste, and smell, will, willfully and unwillingly, with knowledge and in ignorance, rationally and irrationally, and it is impossible to count the multitude of my sins, but in all of them, those committed knowingly and in ignorance, I say and desire in the future and with the help of God, I promise to amend myself. Well, I think we can all find something that strikes us in this. And other things that are probably not quite relevant, like uh, for some, <laughs> like. Uh, not, not keeping their uh, monastic vows, <laughs> or not keeping marriage vows, um, but uh, but this list is a is a very good thing. I'll um, I'll send it to you, and we can put it on the website um, for general distribution. Um, questions. Exactly by remembering the living is dead. Well, okay. This is this. There was a there was a practice that grew up in the Russian church in um, or in among Russians, shall we say, um, not in the church or of the church, um, uh, of uh, putting the names of uh, living people on commemorations for the departed. Is so, there a particular reason? Yeah, because there was this. You know the superstition that it would draw people closer to you. So, like wishing death upon somebody. In a sense. In a, well, I mean, on one hand, it's that. On the other hand, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a magic spell. Well, it's essentially a, oh, it's, it is a magic spell. Sure. Yeah. Brother Karas Montsov, Karas Montsov, was one of the peasant women who came to Father Zosima confess something like that. Her son had been uh, gone off to the war and she had heard from him for a long time. So someone encouraged her to put him in the list of the dead. 
And the priest, of course, is telling her not to do that. Right. So it's something that was being done, and she thought that that would cause him to then write to her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, she would find that he magically would appear. Yeah, magical thinking has not disappeared. <laughs> Um, earlier, when you started your talk, you were mentioning confessing thoughts, and even in this it has that I've sent in word, thought, and deed. So mm -hmm. you did say that it's more appropriate in the monastic setting because you have a spiritual father there. But And so it's not necessarily something that lay people would practice, but can you elaborate on a situation where it would be beneficial for a lay person to well, you, confess their sure. thoughts? Well, in the, in the monastic practice, the point of confession of thoughts is not just confessing the thought, but it's doing it on a daily basis. So that's the practice of confession. It's, it's on this daily basis so that you essentially are completely open, clean, you know, completely free of, um, of afflictive thoughts uh, as far as possible. Um, it's, important to, it's important when we go to, do go to confession uh, to confess thoughts that are, um, that are sinful. Uh, uh, you know, the Lord, you know, for example, the Lord said, if, if you think about a woman to, you know, to commit adultery, whether well, you might as well, you know, or not you might as well have, but, <laughs> but, but you've, already, you've already committed this, you've already committed a sin, essentially. Um, and so, for example, if we have, if we bear hatred or anger or enmity or judgment or against anyone, those are, those are sins. Um, because there, and I'm not talking about just a momentary irritation, but I'm talking about something, you know, that we hold on to. Um, if we, uh, if we engage in, you know, in carnal imaginations, um, that's, that's a sin, especially if we, you know, it's one thing, you know, to just have the image or the thought flick in, through our mind, it's another thing to engage it. Um, uh, and, it and it's the same with any of the passions. <clears throat> um, next week we'll talk about uh, what, are, what, uh, what sins are. Um, we'll talk about the, uh, how, how the church understands levels of sin, um, which include... Uh, levels of uh, sins in thought, and uh, and the relationship between of how a of how a, a thought called a provocation turns into a full blown sin in action, because it's a process, and the fathers talk a lot about this, um, and how to deal with those thoughts, which are the roots of which are the roots of our sins. Um, uh, so. You know, uh, other sins of, of thought or pride, um, and the obverse of pride, um, uh, self-hatred. Um, vainglory, and the obverse of, of vainglory is self-pity. Um, so it's really, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very interesting system that's... That, the, the fathers have worked out, and and what it, and it's given to us in order so that we can live a very attentive spiritual life, um, and uh, you know, and so that when we so that when we go to <coughs> confession, that we really um, that we really cleanse our souls. Now I can I can tell you I've heard just about everything um, that you can. There's nothing I haven't heard that I know of. Um, of course, it's a uh, uh, you, you know you're getting burned out as a priest when you when you want to tell somebody, okay, get a life, <laughs> or okay, tell me something I haven't heard before. <laughs> um, probably not. <laughs> probably better not. But. Um, but seriously, there's I mean, nothing to, you know, false shame is our biggest enemy with confession, you know, because we all sin, we all sin in the same ways. And so uh, it's better to just confess it, own up to it, own it, and that way you can be freed from it. So. You said false shame? False shame. Not really.
Really? Uh -huh. Well, there's all, all sorts of shame. <coughs> guilt and shame are a big deal. Um, guilt is actually a sinful state. And shame can be a sinful state as well. Um, uh, now, there's healthy guilt as well. Now, if, if your soul is healthy and you do something really bad, you're going to feel guilty. And well, you should. Um, but if you turn it into a life long life and life changing thing that just drags you down and down and down and down, then there's a problem there. And that's, and that's a sinful state of being. Um, and, uh, and so basically what, what sins do is that they cut us off from God. It's not that God turns away from us. You know, don't listen to the Calvinists. <laughs> Um, God never turns away from us, ever, no matter what we do, no matter how, how horribly we sin. But we turn away from God. And what sin does is it encloses in, in ourselves. You know, think about guilt, right? What, what happens in guilt? You go around and around and around and around and around in your mind, right? And, and you degrade yourself and you pull yourself down and, and, and you can't relate to anybody and you can't relate to God and you can't, even, can't relate to yourself even. And so guilt is, when it becomes unhealthy, um, becomes a real, a, hu a huge problem. And it, and it turns into despondency and, and despair, which is, which is one of the greatest of the deadly sins. Um, and one of the one of the most uh, most horrific. So um, so it's important. Uh, guilt and shame are not healthy uh, states, and so we need to um, work to overcome them. Um, guilt is I did something bad. Shame is. I did something bad, therefore I am bad, and so and so that's the that's the dynamic. Okay, are we? Is it anybody else? Oh, I, I remember you. I mean, you may have already went back, but I remember you saying we go back to witchcraft and, and whatnot. But I don't know if we still want to do that. Well, yeah, it, it, it was in here. Oh, okay. All right. Because um, people still do it. Yeah. Um, fortune tellers, tarot cards, the occult, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, unfortunately, it's very present in our own culture. But those are like the acts of the devil or like fortune telling? And it's occult, yeah. Yeah, it's never acceptable. You know, and then, you know, in certain like. Um, in um, Caribbean Hispanic culture, you've got Santeria, mm -hmm. and that's that's demonic. That's 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 a very evil witchcraft, and that's something that has to. And usually, it's not just something you have to repent of, but but you have to be exorcised. You have to seek help. Yeah. Yeah. You need, well, you need an exorcism after that. <laughs> it's, it's it's serious stuff. And I've dealt with people who. have forgive the other person but we need to forgive God as we blame God for our problems uh, and then we blame ourselves even more and that's the most that's one of the most important things is to is to be able to forgive ourselves and accept forgiveness and to, and to be able to let go of this whole burden that just that just drags us down um, confession <clears throat> Confession, the remission of sins, is, is this, the first gift that the Lord gave to the church. Um, he appeared in the upper room after the resurrection and said, 
My peace I give to you. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. And whoever sins you retain, they're retained. That's the scary part. The really scary part. Um, but it's... Um, and it's that that defines the, the charism of the priesthood. What does that mean to retain sins from the priest's perspective? It means that you're not forgiven. How, how does that work? <laughs> no. um, what it is, it's you, at least my own experience with it is I've had, I had a clear sense that a person was bound by their sin and they refused to give it up. For example, there was a, um, a Greek family that had become Episcopalian in Eureka, California, which is where I established a mission. And um, their mother was dying in the hospital, and she called me, or she had me called as the, as the closest Orthodox priest to come and visit her and give her confession and, and communion before she died. And her sons would not let me go to see her. They said, no, we had the Episcopal priest, that was enough. And so it was very clear to me, they will have to answer for that sin at the Last Judgment. They're bound by their sin. It's not a matter of me forgiving them. <laughs> I mean, even if I had to drive 250 miles to go and see her. So, um, how, many, how many times do we get into a place of where we're so absolutely obstinate that we refuse to repent of something? Um, it's, it's, it's interesting that, of course, the Catholics have all of this stuff all systematized. You know, they're really good at that. As Westerners, we kind of understand that. You know, they have um, the, the sins against the Holy Spirit, the seven deadly sins. Then they have the four sins that cry out for vengeance. Four deadly sins that cry out for vengeance, which is interesting. Um, and those are murder, sodomy, the oppression of the poor, and defrauding a workman of his wages. <laughs> Hey, look at Wikipedia. <laughs> so, um, of course, the seven deadly sins against the Holy Spirit are despair, presumption, envy, obstinacy and sin, final impenitence, and deliberate resistance to the truth. When a person, you know, basically forget, refuses. Mama. To, refuses God. Yeah. Yeah. It's all scriptural. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with with this. It's just um, our the, our fathers approached it differently than the Latin fathers. Perspective. What's that? Perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The sins apply. <laughs> Definitely, they apply. So. Okay. Nobody else has any questions? Well, I was going to say one thing about fortune telling, but I, I read it here because, you know, well, as you all know, Basili, but uh, Basili was also known for some fortune telling, but when I went back to read it, this, I noticed that uh, it, uh, I forget what it's called, but it said playing cards, and then it sort of said, when it said by fortune telling, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, playing cards is kind of uh, it's just like a vain pastime. Um, it's not on here because this was written in the 19th century, but so it, I can't imagine what Sandy Donnie would say about watching TV. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Can you imagine? Or what he would say about these things? Whew. <laughs> Uh, it turned into a packet instead of uh, two pages. Huh? Yeah, but I, but the uh, the sorcery, I, it's a, I, the playing with cards. It, you, they, it may be referring to something like tarot cards, mm -hmm. something like that. And the Russians were big into all of that stuff. So. Guatemala too, you know, those central countries, central as you go south. <laughs> 
the oath of hope of ever blessed and most pure and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the word, through the hope of us we magnify you. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always known and ever to ages and ages. Amen. Amen.